Greetings everyone, I'm Tom Ballard, the Groundwater Guy, and welcome to Groundwater Talk Live, although in this case it is not so live because I am on the road in a hotel room with crappy lighting, as you can see, so, so I apologize for, for the video quality, but that's just the way it is when you're on the road. I didn't bring the lights and stuff I needed. I just had my uh, um, suitcase was too full of other things. I just couldn't couldn't bring the other stuff. So, but I figured uh, we could get away with it for for this one and get back in the studio for for the next show. So uh, today we're going to talk. Uh, we're going to do a shorter show than usual because I'm recording this and I'm actually going to to play the recording for for the show that'll show up in its normal slot at uh, we go Thursday at 11 a.m. Central Time, so it'll show up on YouTube. Uh, unfortunately, LinkedIn does not allow me to uh, actually uh, post recordings in LinkedIn Live. They don't like that, and, and so they usually block it. I've had challenges with that, so I'm just posting this to, uh, uh, to YouTube and the Groundwater Guy YouTube channel, and then um, I'll post a link to it in, in, in YouTube or, or on LinkedIn. So, uh, so there we go. So today we're going to talk about hydrogeology of the Basin and Range Province of California. So uh, it's going to be a, a shorter video, like I said, but, uh, but I thought it's interesting because I do some water work out in the Mojave Desert, and there are some unique features out there. And, and back in the days when I was in the gold mining business, we did work out in the Mojave Desert too. So, so it's, a, it's got some interesting geology and hydrogeology and some things you may not think about, actually. Um, and interestingly, this year, which is 2023, uh, they've had all the atmospheric rivers hitting California. The Mojave River is actually flowing. The um, Mojave Water Agency typically has to dump water in there to recharge the aquifers. But this year, it's actually flowing. Although, as always, the water is all spoken for, but it is actually flowing, which is uh, a somewhat rare occurrence. I mean, it does happen, but but usually the Mojave River, you know, especially in the summertime, is is pretty dry. But but there is uh, flow going on. So that it is an unusual an unusual year indeed in in the Mojave Desert region of California. Now, <clears throat> the Basin and Range Province of California, and let me bring up my first slide here. Uh, if I can do that, I'm. Um, I don't have all my equipment with me on the road, so bear with me on this. So uh, before we get going, though, I want to say like, comment, and share. That's all good. We are starting to get uh, more subscribers coming in, and all the comments and likes and shares help us kind of beat the algorithm as it is and and uh, get us get us out there where people can see us and and uh, and subscribe so I'm really pushing last year we pushed over a hundred uh, subscribers this year I'd really like to get up uh, uh, between 500 and a thousand and uh, so I'm, I'm really pushing to do that and and by consistently putting out videos and and getting comments likes and shares from people I think we can probably get the exposure we need to bring people in and and I'm gonna to try to keep uh, producing consistent content so so that uh, we can increase our, our library there and, and there's there's interesting information out there for for people to, to to share so so please like comment and share I answer all the comments on on, on the YouTube videos and on LinkedIn so uh, please feel free to to ask anything you like and and I will get you answers so let's move on here so uh, as I said today, we're talking about hydrogeology of the Basin Range Province of California. Let me just show you a little bit of background on the Basin and Range Province. It, it really extends across parts of seven states. So probably primarily Nevada is pretty much all Basin and Range. And then you get into California and Arizona. Uh, in, in California, it's going to be a lot of the Mojave Desert region and then south of, of the Mojave Desert region to the Mexican border. Um, southeastern California is going to be part of the Basin and Range Province as well and Arizona. And then you get into Utah also and, and uh, I believe it actually extends into, into Colorado too uh, and maybe Idaho. So so there, there are some uh, components of that out there. But we're mainly focused today on California because uh, Nevada is kind of a whole separate story. 
But what, what we got here is really the basin range is characterized by alluvial basins, which are shown here in the yellow, and they're separated by linear mountain ranges. The linear mountain ranges, this, this uh, feature is, is formed topogra or, yeah, uh, tropographically by the structure of the area, which is actually where the, the, the continents have actually jammed together and then been pulled apart. And as they've been pulled apart, you develop these listric fault systems, so rotational faults uh, that, that form these, these uh, mountains. So they kind of slide down, kind of at an angle, they slide down, and they're just kind of stacked up like, like dominoes. And in between the mountain ranges, then you have these alluvial basins uh, that are shallower on one side, uh, deeper on the other, and that's because of that rotational uh, uh, faulting that, that goes on. And so, uh, and then that's filled in by, by alluvium. It's mainly going to be alluvial fan type of type of material as well. And, and so uh, these areas are defined structurally in, in the Mojave Desert region. In California, you're going to have uh, the, the southwestern boundary is going to be the San Andreas Fault. And then kind of the northern boundary is going to be the Garlock Fault. So that forms the kind of triangular area there that you can see uh, in, in, in California. We'll look at that area, in Antelope Valley area, in a little bit more detail here. But, but really the, the important thing to remember is you have a lot of uh, the alluvium there is going to be all alluvial fans and Playa Lake deposits. So the alluvial fans are going to be mainly formed by, by flooding and, and from during heavy rains. Uh, in, in, in desert, you get uh, the heavy rains, the torrential rains, the typhoons. They come through and they'll dump a lot of material down into these alluvial fans. So you get a lot of coarse material in there. And then what will happen is during, uh, during uh, less periods of less intense rainfall or, or during drier periods, you basically get finer material. So you'll see alternating bands of these uh, flash flood type materials. It can be very coarse, uh, separated by <clears throat> by uh, shallower zones of, of uh, silts and clays in there, and it's just kind of stacked up. And I'll show you what that looks like in a cross section here. But, <clears throat> but that's basically how it's formed. The Playa Lakes are generally going to be down at the bottom of these basins. And in a lot of cases, we have closed basins. The water doesn't have anywhere to go, so it just flows down from the mountains. It, it goes to these basins. It washes down all the material from, from the mountains uh, and the higher areas, and then it washes it into this uh, um, uh, alluvial basin. And so you'll develop a playa lake, uh, and the water will evaporate. and It'll tend to concentrate minerals in there. So we see a lot of water quality issues that we'll also talk about here in a little bit. Uh, and a lot of nasty stuff forms in these playa lake beds. And, um, of course, in some parts of the Mojave Desert area, they're actually mining salt and, and different uh, borates and, and stuff that's, that's accumulated in these playa lake beds from, from washing down from the mountains and being uh, concentrated in those playa lake beds. But it's also uh, a warning that, you, uh, as we see civilization encroaching on these areas, that they're putting in groundwater wells, and we're starting to see some water quality issues uh, with things like arsenic, chloride, uh, some of those things, uh, uh, radionuclides, uh, showing up in, in, in these areas too. So, so that's important to remember that these Playa Lake beds are basically just concentrators of everything that washes down from the mountains, and it just concentrates in there because it's, there's nowhere else for it to go. So the water evaporates, it leaves all these minerals behind, and it just continues concentrating, concentrating, concentrating. So a lot of the water in, right in the middle of these Playa Lake beds is, is really pretty nasty stuff. So, so that's, that's uh, an important component of, of, uh, of the basin and range and, and how some of these things form. So, uh, and, and so uh, the other thing is that some of these areas, and especially along the, in southern Nevada and in the, uh, um, in the, the, the border between Nevada and California, you have some deeper carbonate and volcanic rock aquifers. So there's some bedrock component that, that's deeper, and there's actually some evidence that some of these basins are connected, especially with the carbonate rocks. So um, there is a potential groundwater resource there that has not been actively tapped. 
but we see some inner basin flow that, that's deeper from, from these uh, uh, deeper aquifers and, and it's connected across basins. So uh, generally in the carbonate rocks, the, the volcanic rock aquifers are, are a little more hit or miss. There's some fracturing going on and then you get some tough deposits and, and some tough breaches and stuff that can form aquifers there. But but generally the, the deeper aquifers that that, that are out there that really haven't been explored well are these uh, carbonate aquifers where there's an aquifer that extends across basins. So, so some, some interesting possibilities for, for the future. And, and so, um, but they haven't really been well explored yet, but there is a lot of evidence right now that, that this is what's going on is you're getting deep groundwater flow in these carbonate aquifers that is flowing across basins. All right. So let me grab a drink here real quick. As I mentioned earlier, a typical cross section of one of these uh, basins in the in the basin range is, and this is a diagrammatic um, hydrologic cross section. You can see we have alluvial fan deposits that are shed from the mountains, and you're seeing in there. You're seeing the gravel deposits, you're seeing the sand, you're seeing the clay, all kind of interbedded in there. And, and so that's, that's, uh, that's basically a feature of, of, of the flash floods. So these deposits are mainly formed by flash floods and, and they're, uh, uh, the inconsistent layering. Uh, and it's um, uh, some of these units uh, kind of come and go. And, and so it, it's really hard to map out actual aquifer zones, you're kind of lumping some of these aquifer zones because they may be, uh, they may be unconfined, they may be semi-confined, some of the deeper ones may be confined, but uh, most of them are truly going to be semi-confined at best because of the, uh, of the inconsistent uh, um, lateral uh, distribution of, of some of these zones. So. Uh, and then in this cross section, we see the, the alluvial fan on the left hand side. And then we get down to the playa and we're getting our, our playa lake bed deposits that are going to be clay silt evaporates. Like I mentioned, um, uh, everything comes down from the mountains and, and the water uh, evaporates. And, and so you get these evaporite deposits and you can get some pretty interesting stuff. Like I said, the borates that, that you find down there, um, that, those are found in very few places in the world. So uh, the Mojave Desert in California is one of those. And you've heard of a 20 mule team borax. Well, that's that's real where, where this came from. So Death Valley and, and some of the other parts of the Mojave Desert, um, they do uh, actually still mine borates out, out there and some, some interesting stuff. And, and salt deposits uh, over near Trona, Trona deposits obviously there as well. And these are all evaporate deposits that form in these Playa Lake beds. So, so interesting geology there. And then these basins are basically going to be surrounded um, by mountains that are going to be low permeability bedrock. And, and so not a lot of uh, hydrogeological connections uh, between basins through these areas, unless you get deeper, like we mentioned, the, the carbonate rocks. So, so this is a typical cross section. They're going to vary a little bit, um, and, and, but, but it gives you an idea of, of basically how these things look. All right, so we're going to look at Antelope Valley, which is uh, down, uh, it's, it's uh, pretty much uh, across the San Gabriels, uh, east of, of Los Angeles, kind of in that general area. Um, this is going to be right at that triangle that I mentioned earlier, where the Garlock Fault comes together with the San Gabriel Mountains. So, so some uh, definitely uh, fault territory with, with some substantial faults there. Obviously, the San Andreas everybody knows about, but the Garlock Fault is a pretty significant fault that's had some movement along it that really shapes the topography in the area. So, a lot of discontinuity of geologic features across the Garlock Fault which is a significant lateral fault to the uh, San Andreas Fault. And, and it really kind of makes this triangular shaped basin where, where the, uh, where the uh, um, San Andreas Fault and the Garlock Fault come together. So, so we have the San Gabriel Mountains kind of running into the Tehachapi Mountains. And these basically are formed by, by the faulting. So, so you have that L shape there or, or the V shape in, in this area that, that uh, 
um, that is forming this, this pally. So the yellow here is going to be your alluvial deposits, your coarse alluvial deposits in the valley. And those are going to be basically, like I said, flash flood type deposits, alluvial fan deposits. And then you get uh, some of the the uh, Playa Lake deposits out there, Redmond Lake and some of these other lakes that you can see that are, that are uh, in kind of that lighter tan color in the middle. Uh, and also underneath here, there's a lacustrine clay. Lacustrine means lake deposit. Clay, uh, it's a confining unit, which means that it's, that it's generally an aquitard and, and relatively impermeable. It separates an upper aquifer zone from a lower aquifer zone. Now remember, these aquifer zones I'm talking about are not consistently uh, a, a thick sand. There's going to be um, inconsistent clay deposits in there that are going to pinch out laterally. And, and so, but you have an aquifer zone that's above this, uh, this lacustrine clay deposit and below it. Below it, it's probably going to be generally considered to be confined in most places towards the boundaries. Uh, this um, this lacustrine clay deposit uh, kind of pinches out, so you, you get into semi-confined conditions uh, near near the boundary. But um, in the middle, you're probably dealing with truly confined uh, aquifer conditions uh, for for the lower aquifer zone. And I'll show you what that looks like here. Um, but first, kind of a generalized cross section here. We can see that uh, we have the San Gabriel Mountains. We're looking generally north here, uh, maybe uh, maybe north uh, uh, north northwest uh, probably. And so we got Antelope Valley in the middle here. We have the San Gabriel Mountains on the left, and then uh, to the left of the San Gabriel Mountains, we have the coastal plain. So Los Angeles is going to be out there, and then to the north you have the Tehachapi Mountains that run roughly. Uh, um, uh, I would say east northeast, uh, basically following the Garlock Fault. So uh, the Antelope Valley itself is a downdrop. So there's there's faults on both sides of the valley, and they drop downdrop the middle of the valley. So this is what we would call a graben. And you have multiple faults on on both sides of the valley that cause the whole thing to to drop down. So that middle portion, and then what happens then is that then fills in with these alluvial sediments, the alluvial fans and the Playa Lake deposits. So that, that's how that's formed. So, so the, the faults, the steep faults on both sides there cause that middle section to drop down, kind of step down, and then the middle part is dropped down enough where it's able to fill in with the alluvial deposits there. And then it forms, forms an actual basin that becomes a hydrogeologic unit, as it were, with an upper aquifer and a lower aquifer zone. So diving in a little deeper, that's that's what that looks like with the, the cross sections we have here. So um, if I go back here, you can see uh, A cross section and B cross section there in the middle. So the A is running uh, kind of north, northwest, and B is running basically east-west. And, and so that's that's uh, where these cross sections are running here. So, so A, A prime, roughly, roughly north south, and you can see that that we have the valley there. We have the, uh, the the consolidated rocks, the bedrock on both sides. We have the uh, the Antelope Valley in the middle is where it's thickest, and then you have that lacustrine clay deposit that's the dark brown in there. So, so you have the principal aquifer that's a little shallower is going to be up above that lacustrine clay deposit. In this case, the deeper aquifer is going to be confined aquifer, so that's going to be your deep, deep aquifer. If we look at the east-west cross-section, BB prime, uh, now you're looking, you're seeing that same uh, lacustrine clay deposit there in the middle that separates the, the shallower uh, principal aquifer from, from the deeper aquifer. And in this case, we, we go to the, to the west and we can see that that lacustrine clay deposit then kind of pinches out. So you end up with semi-confined uh, conditions in that part of the basin. So they're not truly confined, but for the most part, we can generally treat them as the same way we would uh, confined deposits, uh, but, but uh, and, and they're, they're generally going to be under pressure, but just maybe not as much pressure as they are where they are truly confined. So, um, so the, the lacustrine deposits are, are bounded 
that's generally yeah, what what are we looking at? We're about you know fifty maybe. Uh, uh, no, that's about uh, what are we looking at? A couple hundred feet thick there. Yeah, somewhere in there that 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 deposit is generally a couple hundred feet thick, if I remember right. So, so it's a, it's a pretty significant confining unit that that is there. Uh, and once again, that is a lake deposit that was there at one time. It deposited these fine materials that become uh, basically impervious to to gr uh, vertical groundwater flow. And we said impervious. That's that's not that water can't flow through it, but it just flows through it very very slowly unlike a sand. So, so it's not an aquifer. We call it an aquitard, not an aquaclude, uh, because water can, can e eventually flow through it just at a very, very slow rate, uh, non-aquifer, non-aquifer rates. So, so you would not want to count on that for, for recharge, except over thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of years. So, so that's, that's basically what that looks like. All right, so I talked a little bit earlier about this, but connected basin flow systems. So uh, basins are linked through an extended flow system out here, and that really is uh, southern Nevada and into California border area. Uh, we get these deeper carbonate rocks that, that have flow between the basins, and, and actually you're talking a pretty good size area up there. If you look at that yellow area that is... Uh, uh, in southern southern uh, uh, Nevada, extending into to California, that's a pretty significant area where you're getting groundwater flow. So this may be uh, a future resource, uh, but it really needs to be studied so we don't over over tap it and and uh, and and mess it up like we have in in so many places where we where we put straws into it, uh, which are the wells, and we we overdraft it. And, uh, so we we want to manage that resource carefully and and it's deep enough that, that drilling wells is going to be pretty expensive out there so we're going to go after the easier groundwater before we start looking at that but uh, usually the discharge is going to be at springs so you're going to find springs out there in the desert that are going to be uh, where where this this deep rock aquifer system is going to discharge and some of it just just stays down there it does not discharge it just flows across the basin boundaries so um, there, the the way this has been uh, documented is through some modeling by uh, interbasin water level data. So you look at the fluctuations and, and compare them between basins, and when they fluctuate at the same levels over over the same period of time with the same precipitation conditions, then you can generally infer some hydrogeologic uh, uh, connection between those those uh, basins. So. And, and it looks like it, it is those deeper zones. So um, so the bottom line is these carbonate rock aquifers uh, may have significant water production potential. Uh, nobody's really assessed their, their, uh, their storage uh, at this point, but it, it's going to be deep. So it's gonna be expensive. You're gonna to have to drill some pretty deep wells to get in there right now. There's just not the economic incentive to do that, but that may be something that that we look at in the future. All right, so uh, I'm going to flip flop back and forth between two slides here because uh, this this is important to understand. We talked a little bit about playas and how we get these closed basins where the water can't flow out, and so we get we get these playa lakes, and the, basically the water just flows in there and evaporates. So so they're they're an evaporation basin is what they are. So we have a number of uh, we have like five different uh, basin. Uh, types in in the Mojave Desert area in the Basin Range area province, and so there that's going to be an un, uh, and and they're they're illustrated here on this illustration. So uh, from top to bottom, they're they're shown here from from left to right. So we have a, a single basin system, which is going to be an undrained closed basin. And I'll define these in, in the next slide, and then we'll kind of flip flop back and forth a little bit so we can look at these. We have a terminal sink basin, and a terminal sink basin is basically where 
where you have a stream flow and it's basically just going to dump into an area. There's no outlet, so it's just going to dump into a, a playa lake. So uh, a drained closed basin, a partially drained closed basin, that's basically going to be a groundwater flow. And then a connected basin flow system, that's going to be like the Mojave Res River that does actually flow at, at certain times like it is this year, but it is actually connected through basins and it actually flows into the Colorado River, if I'm not mistaken. Um, no, I think I'm wrong on that. I think it flows elsewhere. So I don't think it, yeah, I'm, I may be wrong on that. But, but the Mojave River is, is an example of a connected basin flow system. So, so I apologize if, if I have that wrong. So I don't think it goes, goes over there. There's some divides there. So, so okay, so, so these are illustrated here. I'm going to give you the actual definitions of these in this uh, wordy slide here. So um, once again, a, a single undrained closed basin is going to be a single basin type system. And in this case, the basin has no surface flow across the boundary of the basin. Uh, all groundwater discharge is ultimately by evapotranspiration. So there is no outlet in this basin. It's completely a closed basin that's undrained, both for surface water and groundwater. So, so everything's going to evaporate. And, um, and that's, uh, I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so the groundwater gradient is towards the center or the low part of the valley. So everything flows into, into this basin. So if you map out the groundwater gradient, it's basically going to be a big oval, basically, where everything's flowing in, into this basin. So, and that's a single basin system. These others are multiple basin systems. So a terminal sink basin is a basin that has surface and or surface, uh, subsurface inflow across boundaries. So this is going to be between basins. So uh, it may not have surface flow, but it could be groundwater flow uh, across basins. All groundwater discharge uh, ultimately is by evapotranspiration because it's all going to flow into a terminal sink. There's no outlet for that sink, and it's just going to flow in there, and it's going to evaporate. So uh, a drained closed basin is defined as a basin that has no surface flow across the boundary, uh, almost all groundwater discharges by subsurface outflow. So, so the, there's no going to be no surface outflow, but there is going to be groundwater outflow out of the basin. So, um, uh, the deep water table prevents evapotranspiration. So it's going to be deeper groundwater. So, a partially drained closed basin uh, is distinguished uh, by uh, the basin has no surface inflow or outflow. So. It's a closed basin there, so why is that doing that? Um, all right, so a uh, little technical challenge there. Um, uh, I don't know why I'm getting this, but anyway. Um, hold on a minute. Little technical challenge there. So, uh, so the partially drained closed basin, no surface inflow or outflow. So, so it's going to be closed entirely uh, for surface flows. But uh, the valley has a moist playa and a stand of phreatophyte vegetation. Uh, areas of groundwater discharge can be small in comparison to undrained basins of similar size. Groundwater gradients may indicate subsurface outflow if wells are strategically located. So, so there's going to be limited outflow from these basins that if you have monitoring wells out there, you may be able to see it, you may be able not to. So it's, it's going to be areas of limited outflow for the groundwater. It's going to be relatively shallow, though, so it will support some, some phreatophic uh, vegeta uh, vegetation. So, um, and then lastly, we have the connected basin flow system. So uh, this is a basin that has surface and or subsurface outflow and in or inflow that links several individual basins. Uh, groundwater discharges to playas and or springs or streams. Surface inflow and outflow is by ephemeral and perennial streams. So my, this is where my Mojave River example come, comes into play. So let's go back and look at this again then. So, so we can see um, up here, uh, uh, we can see on, uh, on the, 
the basically the, the left-hand side of our diagram, that is going to be our undrained closed basin. And then we go down, we have our terminal sink basin. So you can see we have a little river there flowing in, and that's going to dump everything into that area where it's going to evaporate. Then we have our drained closed, uh, drained closed basin. So no surface water, but groundwater is going to be able to flow out. Partially drained closed basin is going to be similar. You may have some, some outflow from, from the surface and connected basin flow system is basically going to be uh, a river type system that will flow across uh, boundaries. So, so this is generally how things uh, how the basins work in, in a uh, basin and range system. You're going to have one of these five different uh, types of, of uh, basins uh, within the, the alluvial uh, basin uh, in, in between the mountain ranges in the basin and range system. All right, so water quality issues. Let's grab a drink here. So generally when we get down into the playa areas, uh, we're going to see uh, high TDS, high total dissolved solids. And that's going to be from all the evaporitic deposits in those playa lake beds. It's just, it's accumulated over thousands of years in there and, and it just kind of keeps, keeps evaporating. It doesn't go anywhere, so there's no chance for it to be diluted. So, so you're going to have very high TDS groundwater in these areas uh, and it's not going to be drinkable water for the most part in the center of these playas. It, you're, it's going to be really nasty stuff and it, and it can have things like high arsenic concentration, high fluoride, uh, radionuclides, and all kinds of other heavy minerals that accumulate in there. Uh, just uh, pretty nasty water, probably nothing you'd want to drink. So, so it's it's just you, you want to keep away from those areas if, if you're putting wells because groundwater is going to be impacted in in those uh, lake beds. And uh, but because they're nice flat areas, it, it seems like a nice area to develop. But but your your groundwater is is going to be an issue. So um, so the TDS can vary across the area and by geologic conditions, but it's going to be highest in these playa lake beds. So. Uh, in the, uh, in the um, uh, Basin and Range area in California, 16% of wells are impacted with contaminants above the MCL. And we'll, look, we'll look at specifically what those are here in a, in a following slide, but 16% but, uh, of wells, and, and a lot of times those are wells that are going to be down close in, in these playas. And so that's, that's a, a factor of, of the evaporite deposits. So the South Lahontan um, hydrogeologic region, which basically is, is the uh, Mojave Desert region, uh, California Regional Water Quality Control Board breaks things out into hydrogeological reason, uh, regions. And so we are in the South Lahontan hydrogeological region when we talk about the Mojave Desert area. So, so this shows, uh, the left-hand pie chart shows uh, that 84% of the wells generally meet primary MCL standards of 605 wells sampled. So, so it's a pretty good size sample, not a huge sample. This has been, you know, a few years now since those wells were sampled. I think this might have been 2010, so a little out of date. This, these numbers probably have shifted a little bit since then, but, but you get the idea anyway. So 16% of the wells are impacted by at least one constituent that's above the primary MCL. And how those break out then is this flow, is this uh, pie chart on the right hand side here where we're looking at 57% uh, of those contaminants are inorganic, 21% are radiological, so radionuclides, uh, which are very common down in the uh, Mojave Desert region. This mainly has the fact to do with uh, it's a lot of plutonic rocks down there, granitic rocks, although I believe there are some uh, sedimentary type uh, and metamorphic type uh, uh, radionuclide deposits, uranium deposits in that area, but uh, uh, I have no idea what's going on here with that. Keeps plopping up here, so uh, computer's doing what it wants to do, I guess. 
So, um, so you do get a fair, a significant amount of radionuclides in wells in, in Southern California and the Mojave Desert region. So 21% of the 16% then, so almost a quarter of, of the contaminated wells are contaminated with, uh, with radionuclides. So 16% um, is nitrates. Nitrates uh, obviously are, are fairly common where we get uh, farming and, and uh, agriculture going on. So, uh, and that's gonna be a shallow groundwater contaminant. 2% pesticides, 4% are going to be volatile organic compounds or semi-volatile organic compounds. So, so by far and away, the vast majority of the contaminated wells are going to be inorganic. And let's look at the breakout here of those uh, inorganics. Uh, generally, probably the biggest one here is fluoride. Um, and this, once again, is a feature of these Playa Lake beds. You get a lot of fluoride around there. Uh, fluoride generally shows up in, in these uh, fine sediments in the Playa Lake beds, but also in, in darker uh, uh, shaley uh, mudstone, you know, black, uh, black mudstone deposits, the sedimentary deposits you'll find can be high in fluoride. So, so that's what you want to look at, look at when, you're, when you're drilling your wells. And the same goes for arsenic. You, you can a lot of times identify zones just geologically when you're logging a well uh, that, that are likely to contain fluorides or, or arsenic. And arsenic indeed is, is the second highest uh, inorganic contaminant. As a matter of fact, arsenic is the number one contaminant of groundwater wells in the state of California, period. And actually, it is arsenic is the number one contaminant of groundwater wells in the world. So, uh, as a matter of fact, they say in, in India that 25 percent of groundwater wells are are uh, impacted by by arsenic. So, so it's a pretty significant contaminant around the world. And then antimony uh, shows up, and this this is kind of a weird one. I think it it has to do with. Um, uh, Antimony is going to be a hydrothermal mineral, so around hot springs areas, uh, which, which you get in the Mojave Desert, and then it accumulates into these Playa Lake beds. And I think that's probably where the antimony comes from because it's, it's formed in, in uh, hydrothermal mineral deposits is, is generally the source of, of the antimony. So uh, secondary inorganics, iron, manganese, the usual suspects by far and away in that area. And then you're getting violations uh, between in specific inductance and, and TDS. And, and uh, as we pointed out in the map earlier, that's, that's not unexpected. Radiological is broken out uh, mainly. Uh, gross alpha is probably the big one. Uranium uh, and uh, radium is, is a lesser percentage once again. So gross alpha, which is really related to uh, alpha particles generated from the decay of radioactive minerals. Uh, gross beta doesn't show up on here, but I know that we do see gross beta out there also. Uh, but gro gross alpha is one that's uh, definitely monitored and, and it shows up a, a fair amount. So um, you got your nitrates uh, and nitrites. So those show up uh, fairly significantly. Pesticides, um, uh, this is kind of a tough one. The one that shows up is, is di-2-ethylhexyl uh, phthalate. And so that shows up, uh, basically that showed up in a couple wells. So there are pesticides being, out, being used out there. And then the last category is volatile organic compounds and, and um, um, uh, semi-volatile organic compounds. The big one there, uh, and, and most of these are fairly minor, they, they, uh, but uh, MTBE, TC, which is a solvent, and then good old carbon tetrachloride that's been banned for, for what, going on 50 years now, um, still shows up out there. Uh, it's, it's, amazing. it's an amazingly persistent compound uh, that, that really has not been in use for, I believe, it's over 50 years. And, and uh, it still shows up out there, which shows the remarkable persistence of some of these uh, contaminants out there. So that, that it would show up on a, on a list like this when it's uh, not been used for, for so long. So, so that's basically what, what the contaminants look like. Uh, generally, uh, you know, when you're, when you're down in this area, you know, some of the things you really want to be looking at, besides the usual iron and manganese, which, which you can get almost anywhere, fluoride and arsenic uh, are biggies, and the radionuclides are probably the big ones you've got to be careful about when you're putting in wells and you want to assess 
uh, whether you have those contaminants in, in your wells and in that area when, when, you're, when you're starting to look at where you're going to put a well and how deep you're going to put it and what types of geology you have out there. So, so that's, that's basically it on, on, uh, on the, uh, <clears throat> on the hydrogeology. It's, it's, this is kind of just a quick overview to give you an idea, but, but it is fascinating, uh, uh, especially with the closed basins and, and the, uh, the water quality issues associated with the Playa Lake beds. And so that's kind of, I guess that keeps, keeps me in business is evaluating these things. Uh, and really it's amazing how often fluoride pops up uh, in, in these areas. And, and it's something that a lot of people don't think about. They think of fluoride uh, being in, in your water supply and, and fluoridated water supply. Uh, and then they don't, they don't realize that fluoride is actually a regulated contaminant in, in groundwater. And so too much fluoride in groundwater is, is bad for you. So <laughs> as opposed to the fluoride they put in your water, but that's a whole other issue that, that is pretty controversial is, is fluoridated water supply. But uh, we won't go there today. Maybe another day on another show we can, we can talk about that issue. Anyway, if you have any comments you wanna, and you want to contact me directly, uh, I, I appreciate comments on my YouTube videos and on LinkedIn. But if you want to contact me directly, you can reach me at tballard at groundwaterguy.com. And I do respond to all emails, so I'm happy to hear from you. Um, we uh, broadcast into YouTube on the Groundwater Guy YouTube channel, and all our videos are there. I think at this point, at the time of this video, we had over 80 videos up there, so, so there's a lot of stuff up there. Uh, we, we generally go live on, on LinkedIn Live, but, but not this time because of this is going to be a recording and they don't like that. I do stream into Facebook and Twitch also, but but that's more of an experiment because we really don't have much of an audience there and, and I don't expect to get one, but I'm I'm checking it out to, to see if we can we can reach more people. So uh, so um, we like to have guests on the show. So if you're interested in, in being a guest on Groundwater Talk Live, this is the link for that. You can book a session and come on if you got a groundwater issue to talk about. I love to have you on. And um, and so that, that's the link there. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe uh, to the Groundwater Guy YouTube channel. Hit the bell there if you want to know when new videos come out. But we do this every Thursday at 11 o'clock Central Time. So, so come and join us uh, when we go live. I like to have people on asking questions. So, so join us, but don't forget to subscribe and, and check out the other, other videos. Thanks, and I 